afternoon, colleagues. Um, we are making good use of our time by making this a little bit of a presentation lunch. Um, my name is Elise Leroux. I'm from the African Futures and Innovation team at the Institute for Security Studies. And I just going to briefly, for the next 10 minutes or so, take you through our um, climate change report on the future of climate change in Africa. And then that will be followed by my colleague, Dr. Dr. Yaki Silia, that will take you through Africa's energy transition. And then that will be followed by a panel discussion. So if you are with your back um, towards me, that is fine. You can just listen, and then now and then you can just turn your head to, to look at the screen. So just maybe to quickly say that what I'm going to take you through is also available on our African Futures website under um, the climate theme, um, which is our open and accessible website that Yaki also spoke about and briefly presented this morning. So we all know that the world is in the grips of a climate crisis. I think in this, and we also know that this is driven by the re relentless surge in CO2 emissions. In, I want to open up this interactive graph just to take you through it. In 2023, the world recorded a CO2, global CO2 in the atmosphere of 424 parts per million. So this is a new record. This is up from the 280 parts per million that was recorded in the pre-industrial levels and also CO2 emissions, annual CO2 emissions, peaked at 36.1 billion tons last year. And this is despite all the frameworks, all the mitigation actions, and all the current policies that's currently in play on the continent. While this is concerning, we also know that 2023 saw various climate records being broken. It was officially declared the warmest year on record. 1.48 degrees Celsius warmer than pre-industrial levels. And also we saw 50% of the days in 2023 exceeding the critical one and a half degrees Celsius threshold. November saw a couple of days exceeding the critical two degrees Celsius threshold. I think and if we wanna keep this into perspective, the Paris Agreement states that we need to end somewhere between 350 and 400 parts per million in the year 2050, if we are to keep the Paris Agreement from one and a half degrees Celsius alive. Our current forecast, using the International Futures Forecasting Platform, shows that on the world's current development trajectory, we will see CO2 emissions, annual or CO2 emission concentrations of 515 parts per million in the year 2050. So we can see quite a far way off from where we want to be and where we are currently heading. So dr the drivers that's causing this, the surge in CO2 emissions. So I'm just going to open up this map, which shows you the, the emission of the world's um, countries versus CO2 emissions per country. So this is 2023. So the world's top 10 emitters are currently responsible for emitting 70% of all CO2 emissions from fossil fuels. So these includes the countries of the US, China, India, Russia, Japan, Indonesia, Iran, Germany, Saudi Arabia, and South Korea. Africa, on the other hand, currently in 2023, is emitting less than 5% of fossil fuel emissions, global fossil fuel emissions. So this picture is slowly changing I'm just going to open up a 2020, 2063 forecast. By 2050, we are forecasting that Africa will emit 11% of global emissions. And by 2063, we are forecasting that Africa will contribute 16%. And I think, again, just to state that this is only a handful of countries in Africa that would be responsible for emitting and contributing to Africa's contribution. Currently, 70% of the African continent's emissions come from only four countries. This is South Africa being the largest emitter at 27%, followed by Egypt at 19%, and then Nigeria at 11 and Algeria at 11%. Again, this picture will slowly start changing. We are forecasting on the current development trajectory that the world will see a peak in CO2 emissions in the year 2033. By 2050, the African contribution 
that we are estimating would be around 11%. The countries that will be contributing to this, by far the biggest contributor would be Nigeria, contributing around 20% of a continent's contribution. This will be followed by Egypt at 14%, and South Africa dropping to 7% and Algeria to 5%. South Africa's very big drop comes from um, a decline in its population growth, but also its various policies in decarbonizing its economy. Nigeria, on the other hand, will see rapid increases in population. We've spoken about that, um, as well as its abundant oil and gas resources. By 2063, Nigeria will emerge not only as Africa's biggest contributor to CO2 emissions, but in fact, it will be responsible for contributing 4% to global emissions. So what we have done is we've modeled several policies that I want to take you through. Yaki will just shortly after I'm done speaking, he will take you through um, two of our scenarios where we looked at what would be the implication of things like um, more stringent mitigation and adaptation policies, as well as an Africa energy transition scenario. But I just want to talk a little bit about the role of a global carbon tax and its impact. So we modeled four tax, global carbon tax scenarios. Uh, a global tax framework, as you would be well aware of, is not a new initiative. I mean, this is backed by institutions like the World Bank and the IMF, Last year at the Nairobi Climate Summit, Africa leaders echoed this plea, and they also called for a global carbon taxation regime to provide dedicated finances for climate positive investments. There's a lot of narratives when we talk about a global carbon tax, but despite its, the plea and despite its well-known well um, benefit, globally there's only 37 carbon tax initiatives that's been implemented. While around 26% of the globe's carbon emissions are, have a carbon pricing strategy behind it, be it an emission trading system or a global carbon tax, less than 6% of global GHG emissions are currently um, covered by a carbon tax. Amongst the world's top 10 emitters that I showed you on that map, it is only Japan that has adopted a global carbon tax. And the rest of them are either considering emission trading systems or have subnational emission trading systems or is shying away from this altogether. So we looked at four scenarios. The first one is a wealthy pay scenario where we place the responsibility of carbon taxing um, on the world's um, most wealthy countries, high income countries, which are held being accountable for their historical emissions reflecting the argument that their current development status has been largely facilitated by their past emissions. The second scenario is where we shift the burden to the world's top 20 polluters, compelling them to bear the financial burden of carbon taxation. By placing a carbon tax on the world's top 20 polluters, we are covering around 80% of the world's emissions covering around 60% of the world's population, which generates around 76% of the world's GDP. The third scenario that we looked at is an everyone pay scenario. We, we put a carbon tax, a very, very low carbon tax on all countries and make them responsible for bearing the, the brunt of it. And then finally, a fourth scenario, we employed what we called a shared responsibility model, where every country is assigned a differentiated carbon tax based on their income status. So all countries are taxed as is a collective response, but taxed according to their income status. So levying a carbon tax from 25 US dollars per, um, per ton for the low income countries, all the way up to 100 US dollars per ton for the high and wealthy income countries. So then the last two graphs that I wanna show is just the impact that this can have on CO2 emissions. This is a graph that shows you the world's current trajectory, as well as the four scenarios in terms of um, CO2 emissions, annual CO2 emissions. So currently we are here in 2023, the 36.1 billion tons that I spoke about. This is the current power forecast that shows a peak in 2033. And then you can see on the current trajectory, we are forecasting this will be very slow, and reluctant, and then afterwards dropping slightly a bit. These are the four scenarios. The scenario with the biggest impact to reduce carbon emissions is the differentiated pay scenario. 
So where we say that each country has a role and a responsibility towards a global carbon tax framework, but that low-income countries are taxed lesser and high-income countries more. Lower-income countries, of course, utilizing that tax for domestic needs, while wealthier-income countries should assign some of that for the development needs in terms of adaptation and mitigation in developing countries. So we are forecasting that, um, leveraging this differentiated pay scenario, the benefit would be that by 2050, um, CO2 emissions would be around 15% less than on the current path trajectory, and by 2063, this would be around 25% less. I think, and then the last slide that I just want to open up, or that I want to close with before I hand over to Yaki to talk about Africa's energy transition, is to say what will this do to the CO2 annual or the cumulative CO2 in the atmosphere? So I think what I want to show is by 2050, if we do adopt a carbon global carbon tax framework, parts per million in the atmosphere would still be 508 parts per million. Keeping in mind, we are striving for 350 to 400 parts per million by the year 2050. So that what this shows us is while this does have an enormous impact on CO2 emissions and lowering that, much, much more is needed. And we are arguing, and, and, and I also invite you to read the report on the website, is that Africa's contribution in terms of the role that it will play comes from its natural carbon sequestration possibilities. And this is in the form of protecting its ecosystems, specifically its grassy ecosystems, as well as its forests, as well as reforestation from some of its critical forest lands. Okay, Yaki, I'm going to stop there and hand over to you. <coughs> Thanks very much, Elise. So, Elise spoke about um, uh, the forecasting that we did with regard to clim Africa's climate change future, and we modeled, as she indicated, the impact of four different uh, carbon emission scenarios and see what the impact of that would be. Um, what uh, I now want to speak about is Africa's future energy transition. Um, so, again, everything is on the website. You got, each of you got a brochure and there's a page. Everything I'm going to show you is on the website. I'm going to, again, uh, use the, um, what we refer to as the slider, which is just a, a very short summary of, of what we've done and sort of summarizes our main takeaways. So, the first point to start with is just to make the point that energy is absolutely essential to economic growth and human progress. Uh, rapid human development occurs at about 8.6 barrels of oil equivalent per person. So if we are comparing energy from uh, gas, coal, oil, uh, nuclear, uh, and so on to one another, other renewables, you need to convert it into a standard uh, way of comparing it. We use barrels of oil equivalent. Um, so everything I'm presenting you is in barrel oils, barrels of oil equivalent. So, for rapid development, you need about 8.6 barrels of oil equivalent per person per year. The average for Africa at the moment is about 3.2. So, Africa needs to tr almost triple its energy requirement for rapid development. And it has a very rapidly growing population. The average in the rest of the world is about 13.6 barrels of oil equivalent. So, that just to put things in perspective. This is a chart that shows energy production in Africa. Um, so it is from, 20, uh, from uh, 2000 with a forecast until 2063. Um, <clears throat> this is at the bottom here. This is renewables. Um, this is, oops, sorry. Let me go back there. Um, it's the six types of energy that... Um, uh, I'm sorry, I went to the wrong place there. It's the, uh, showing you the energy forecast in the six types of energy that we have forecast for and that we have modeled. <clears throat> so at the bottom right here, you can see this is renewables at the bottom right, then oil and gas, um, and a little bit of nuclear a little bit of hydrogen, uh, a little bit of nuclear, uh, um, and some, hi some hydro at the top. So that's our current path forecast. 
of energy production in Africa. You will see a very large role still for oil, gas, and coal in this current path uh, forecast. This is energy demand per person in Africa. On the left, oh sorry, four different regions in the world. Bottom left is Africa. As I said, about 3.2 uh, barrels of oil per person. By 2050, it will be about 4.9, going up to about 6.4. We're in the United States, uses over 40, almost 41 barrels of oil equivalent at the moment. Going down slightly to about 38 and then 37, uh, by 2063. So the U.S., given its huge energy uh, um, demand per person, has the potential for slight reductions, but it is a hugely energy inefficient, but also energy guzzling uh, country globally. We can see what happening, what's happening with India, with China, and the European Union. To keep the Paris goal alive, the United Nations Environmental Program wants global coal production to end in 2040, and oil and gas production to reduce from 25% of their 2020 volumes by 2050. We have modeled that. There are 20 African countries that produce about 4% of the world's coal, 10% of the world's oil, and about 7.6% of the world's gas. Now, most of our oil and gas is exported, and then we import again, to a degree, the refined product. So we've explored, the, the, we've created a scenario to model what would be the implication of implementing the UN Environmental Program goal, and that goal would allow the 1.5 degree Paris goal to be kept alive. To do that, we reduced coal production by zero to 2040. We reduced oil and gas to 20% of its 2020 value by 2050. We increased renewables, hydro and nuclear as much as we think is reasonably possible. We lowered energy demand to GDP growth. That is a measure of energy efficiency. And then we invested in significant carbon sequestration. As Elise already mentioned, actual fact at the end of this, our, one of our major conclusions is that Africa's contribution to a livable planet is an actual fact through carbon sequestration because our growing population and low energy demand means that inevitably Africa's energy requirement is going to increase, and dramatically so. And then we also modeled a little bit of carbon capture and storage. So once we did that, this is the result of the modeling. The top line is, so this is coal. This is coal production in a business as usual um, forecast. That's the top line. And the scenario we created is the bottom line. You can see it takes coal down to zero by 2040. And we did the same, so, so the current path forecast, the reduction, the scenario. We did the same for oil. Top line is the current path forecast where we think coal, uh, oil production in Africa will go. Bottom line is the scenario that then takes um, oil production down to 20% of its 2020 value in 2050. This is gas, and this is the bigger problem because you can see um, that the amount of gas that Africa probably will have um, produced over time is increasing dramatically. So when you reduce, when we create a scenario that reduces that gas, which is what we do on the bottom line, um, it create collectively these two, well, these three, coal, coal, oil, and gas reductions means that if you look at Africa's total energy, our total energy production, the top line is the business as usual forecast, the bottom line is the uh, scenario that you've created, you end up with an energy gap that is simply too large to fill. That's basically the problem. So long short of this story is Africa cannot rapidly enough move away from fossil fuels. If from an energy perspective, it's just not possible because rene uh, renewables, hydrogen, um, wind, solar, nuclear can't fill the gap. 
maybe there's some other technology that oh, oh, in time could come. So, although much, most of Africa's gas is exported, the energy production gap that follows the implementation of the UNEP recommendations is large and will constrain Africa's development. Africa must embark upon a low emissions pathway from fossil fuels in its own and global interest. The climate covers all of us. We all may need to make our contribution. In a business as usual forecast, Africa will release more carbon than China in 2065. China is by far the largest uh, uh, carbon emitter. And by 2083, our energy demand will be larger than China because we have a massively growing population coming from very low levels of energy use. In summary, Africa needs to support, uh, needs support to allow a slower transition from fossil fuels and others need to give us space to do that. Whilst avoiding, of course, the danger of stranded assets. Because you now have the situation that the rest of the world says decarbonize, we are not going to invest in oil, coal and gas. And Africa says we can't do that. We need to invest in particularly in gas. Can Africa trade its potential as a carbon sink? We think that's in actual fact the major trade-off. And there's some experts here that probably uh, would be able to comment on that. Can a global carbon tax contribute? Now, we did not, Ali spoke about a global carbon tax, four scenarios. We did not include a global carbon tax in this. Firstly, because Africa produces less than 5% of carbon. It doesn't really make sense. And Africa won't embark upon a carbon tax in isolation from the rest of the world. And we did an African scenario, not a global scenario. We estimate that for Africa to be able to grow, and we modeled a high growth forecast, we need about 13% of the global carbon emissions. Our carbon budget for Africa should be about 13% of global carbon emissions by 2050 and about 22% by 2063. I think it's an interesting finding because I'm not sure that anybody else really has done a carbon budget forecast previ uh, previously. To conclude, Africa will not be able to close the demand gap following the end of coal production by 2040 and sharp reductions in oil and gas by 2050, as UNEP recommends to keep the 1.5 degree goal alive. The continent needs space for a slower transition from fossil fuels, while, of course, constraining green greenhouse gas emissions. It's like a statement of fact. How can Africa move this differently? So the countries will, that will be the most affected are listed there, from Angola to Zimbabwe. Those are the 20 countries in Africa that produce coal, oil, and gas. A carbon tax on countries with a high per capita emission and those that have historically benefited from a high uh, carbon growth path should, amongst others, contribute and fund to Africa's energy transition. There's no other way to do this. And everybody has a vested interest in climate. Land and forest management in Africa could make an immense contribution to cl climate mitigation. Africa is the uh, co um, support of um, sustainable Forestry and so on and so forth in Africa are hugely important. Debt for nature or debt for climate swaps could also facilitate debt repayment by investing in nature ge regeneration and climate action. Africa must implement energy and material efficiency measures. We are very energy inefficient in, in Africa. We don't have uh, grids. Uh, we use diesel, um, road transport. So there's huge opportunity and potential for much more energy efficiencies in Africa. And the U.S., amongst others, through uh, Power Africa, is contributing to that. Industrial development, Africa must industrialize. Um, we need to have a, a low-carbon industrialization pathway, but there's no other way to change the fundamentals of our economies. But we must proceed with the appropriate technologies that minimize carbon emissions. And Africa must lever the opportunities of beneficiation, local production, and manufacturing towards a low-carbon economy. So, um, colleagues, I'm going to stop there. That's, uh, again, a set of work that was funded by Humanity United uh, that we did. We, Alice and I finished this earlier this year. Actually, it was uh, launched a week ago. Um, and uh, this and the other work that we've done is all available on the African Futures website. 
with all the bells and whistles. Uh, this is just a very short summary I've given you of the main takeaways. So I'll stop there and hand over to somebody who knows what she's talking about.